toys in every store? Ha ha ha. Can you sing the rest for me? But the prettiest sight you'll see is the holly, holly that will be on your own front door. Thank you for helping me so much with that. I appreciate it. It is Christmas time, and we have these beautiful images of Christmas, don't we? We want beautiful Christmas, right? We want Christmas that just is packaged beautifully. We want everyone adorning sweaters and everyone adorning their very Sunday best. And, and we want us, oh, I think I have a picture of kind of the perfect Christmas, right? This is kind of the perfect Christmas, and the perfect little Christmas family, or, you know, having dinner with a roaring fire and, and there's, you know, there's chestnuts and I don't even know what chestnuts are, but they're there, right? And, and there's all it's just, it's just this beautiful time of year where everything is just perfect, 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 perfect. And yet it's never that way, is it? <laughs> Christmas is never perfect, 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 perfect. Christmas is a whole lot more like the Griswold family Christmas, <laughs> where the turkey explodes, right? <laughs> and everything and that could go wrong does go wrong. The Christmas that you and I experience is fighting with friends and family, fighting with traffic, overcooking the turkey, yelling at the kids, fighting a cold, giving and receiving presents that you don't want and no one else wants. Hanging out with friends and family that you'd quite rather be done with. <laughs> the Christmas reality and the Christmas desire are just not the same thing. Christmas reality is unwanted travel, untimely medical problems, unpleasant decor, uncomfortable situations, and unbearable people. That's the reality of Christmas. But we don't, we want Christmas to be perfect. But this is much more, I mean, really, right? Isn't, Christmas is never quite like we hoped it would be. And I don't know why it is. After all of the years, we, we still want that perfect, perfect Christmas. Even though it's kind of like that, that purple unicorn. It doesn't exist. It doesn't, it's just like every time we, we go for it, it just, it's not there. Christmas is always chaos. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about Christmas being chaos. Christmas is defined by chaos. It, Christmas was chaos for your parents. Christmas was chaos for your grandparents and for your great-grandparents. It was always chaos. And it will continue to be chaos in the spirit of Christmas because all the way back to the birth of Jesus, the story of Christmas was not perfect, perfect, perfect. It was chaos. I mean, truly, think about the story of Christmas, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to talk about the first Christmas, and we're going to stop looking at it through those eyes of nostalgia. And we're going to stop looking at it as Christmas cards, and we're going to look at it for what it is. And we're going to recognize, you know what, the first Christmas was pretty chaotic. I'm sure it's not what Mary intended it to be. I hope you have your Bibles. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2 to study that first Christmas. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world would be registered. And, when, and this was the first registra registration that when Cornelius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house in the lineage of David. Oh, good. A road trip. It starts out right from go. A road trip in the family station wagon. We don't have wagons so much. And now it's the family van or the family minivan. But, you know, they didn't even have the family minivan to be, you know, stuck inside with your friends and family. They had a donkey. That sounds pleasant. The, the road trip, unwanted travel. 
Now, I just want to say, now, I used to live in Chicago, and my family is here, and I had to come back and forth. Now, Chicago should be six and a half hours to seven hours. Six if you drive ungodly fast, all right? But if you get to Chicago, the traffic is ridiculous, and you will be stopped, all right? And then it'll take you another hour, because we lived on the north side, which meant you had to go through the city, which was horrendous and uh, just, just terrible. And at Christmas time, the traffic just goes through the roof. It's just absolutely bananas. And literally, again, six and a half hours, that's the average trip, sometimes seven, seven and a half. We came home one Christmas, it took us 13 and a half hours. 13 and a half hours. Now that's from, you can get to Florida in 13 hours, all right? And we simply went from Chicago to Columbus, 13 hours. It was snowing, and it wasn't just snowing a little, it was snowing. I don't remember how many years ago, that, that was probably like four or five years ago. There was this awful, awful snowstorm, and you know, we're coming home, and we just came home anyway in the middle of this awful, awful snowstorm. So I say that to say this, traveling is hard. Traveling is hard. I know it. Some of you know it. Some of you have traveled for Christmas. Some of you may be traveling for Christmas this week. Some of you will have guests to your home who have traveled. And I plead with you, be ever so nice to them. Because they are ready to stop. <laughs> they need somebody to be kind, all right? Just be really kind to them. They are traveling. And, and, they, and I'm not saying, I say unwanted. They want to be with you. They have traveled an ungodly amount of hours and trapped in a little box, right? <laughs> They want to do it, and at the same time, there's a part where they, it's, it's just one of those things where, you know, it's hard. It's just hard work, and it's, you know, it takes up the day and all these things, so I want to say, so the first Christmas begins with unwanted travel. Do you think that they wanted to go on a road trip with Mary being pregnant? No. <laughs> they did not want to do this. This, is, this was unwanted. Secondly, not only were they traveling, but they were traveling while she was pregnant. It was untimely. And there always is, isn't there? Every year at Christmas time, you will have some sort of untimely medical issue. I don't care if it's just a cold. Half of you in this room have a cold. I know that. I can see you. You're wiping your noses and sneezing. You all have colds, and then you're shaking my hand. Thank you very much. I already had the cold, so I probably gave it to you, so it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's a doozy this year, this cold. It's like two weeks. It just hangs on. It's awful. Anyways, there's always something, right? At Christmas time, we, don't, we want to pretend that everyone will be just perfectly healthy and everything will be different, but some of you are going to be sick. You're going to have colds. You may have the flu. Some of you are going to trip over something and you have to go to the hospital and get something fixed untimely. It's not going to be the way that you think it should be. There'll be untimely medical issues. Mary and Joseph did not want to have a baby away from friends and family. They didn't want to be out, out somewhere else. Think about how untimely that is. Do you think you'd want to have your child away from everyone you know? No, this wasn't where she wanted to have her baby. This isn't how she envisioned it. Untimely. Verse 7. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Unpleasant decor. This is not a very holiday decorated facility. We're talking about a barn, stable. Actually, a lot of commentators believe that it wasn't actually as stable as we think. When we see the nativity, it's always a little stable. A lot of times, animals were actually kept in, like if they had a little cave, they would keep them in a cave. So a lot of stables for the animals would be caves. So it's very likely that Jesus could have been born in a cave there with Mary. It was unpleasant to look at. You've been to barns. You know what they smell like. Can you remember? Yeah. Unpleasant. Did not quite have the potpourri sense that, you know, mom puts out at Christmas. It's not the same. Now, some of you have to have perfectly, perfectly wrapped Christmas gifts. I, I hear the giggles. <laughs> 
Some of you, not all of you. Now, if you, would you, who would just, who would just admit with me that you're a terrible rapper? I am a really terrible rapper. I, I'll just say this. I give good gifts, all right? I like, I do. I give good gifts, but I rap them terribly. I do. I do not care about the rapping. I never have. I never will. I, to this day, give birthday presents every year in brown paper bags. This is what I do. I, I figure it's paper. You will rip it. It will be a surprise. Ta-da! And it didn't cost me anything. <laughs> and I like that, right? But I know for some of you, you know, it's just, it's, you know, the Christmas gift is an art. And I don't know how long people spend on it, but it seems like a long time. And, and every, every crease is just perfect. And just, you know, just, just, just a few pieces of tape, and then there's a bow, and it's all, it just looks like something out of a magazine. And you go, I don't know if I can un unwrap this. It's so beautiful. You know, I mean, there's, this is, it's, it can't be done. And I know some of you, uh, that's, that's for you. And other people, that's, you know, the, you're me, and you, you give these awfully wrapped gifts like myself. And, and, then, and then people look at the gift, and they hold it. They look at your brown paper bag, and they just shake their head. They go, you're not even trying. You're not even trying, are you? And I say, and I, and I don't understand it because I go, no, I'm not. It's, that's the bag. You're going to throw it away. <laughs> I'm not trying on the wrapping. That's trash. The gift on the inside, that's what I want you to see, regardless. So I just admit, I don't wrap gifts well. But I go back to the first Christmas. The first Christmas, the greatest gift ever given, Jesus Christ. What was he wrapped in? Swaddling clothes laid in what? A manger. So I go back to Jesus and say, look, if Jesus can be wrapped in a manger, my gifts can be in a brown paper bag, all right? It's okay. Think about that. Think about that. The first Christmas gift, Jesus Christ, came in such humble wrappings, swaddling clothes, in a manger, in a stable, perhaps in a cave. Such humble, humble wrappings can come such wonderful, wonderful gifts. Uncomfortable situations, absolutely. A barn, a stable, it doesn't get much more uncomfortable than that. Where were the candy canes? Where was the cocoa? There's not even a comfortable chair, let's be honest. We're sitting on the floor here. We're, sit we're putting children in feeding troughs. There's nothing comfortable about this. There's no caroling, there's no Christmas turkey, there's nothing. And just like that, just like, you know, every Christmas party, right, there's always like Uncle Joe, right? I don't have an Uncle Joe, but I know some of you have, must have an Uncle Joe, who invites that friend or that person that's really not welcome to Christmas. And all of a sudden, Christmas kind of takes a, a left turns and goes kind of catawampus and just crazy. And in the same way, this is, this is exactly how the first Christmas went. The first Christmas. Uncle Joe invited that weird guy, the shepherds. <laughs> Cousin Eddie, that's his name? Cousin Eddie. All right, we'll use Eddie. Cousin Eddie invites him. You know who Cousin Eddie is in the first, in the first Christmas? The angels. The angels get so excited, they just invite anybody. I mean, really, that's, that's it's like the first person they see. They go, it's like walking outside. Hey, you! <laughs> we want you to come! And they see shepherds. Now, think about that. You've just had a baby. This is your special moment. Do you want the angels inviting the first person they see, shepherds, I mean farmers, dirty animal farmers, and saying, hey, would you come and like to see the baby? Is that what you wanted? I know most of you had children, and you had children like in a hospital. Would you want strangers showing up, being like, hey, we didn't bring a gift, but how about a hug? <laughs> I mean, this is the first Christmas. Unwanted guests. It's chaos, isn't it? I mean, these are these they smell bad, they have bad manners, they brought nothing, they're not wearing Christmas sweaters. It's very disappointing. It's not like Christmas should be at all. The first Christmas was absolute chaos. Unwanted travel, untimely medical problems, unpleasant decor, uncomfortable situations, and unbearable people. Your Christmases look better now, don't they? 
I mean, your Christmases almost look Hallmark-ish all of a sudden. When you really consider the chaos of the first Christmas, your Christmases look pretty good because you didn't get a gift in a bag and you didn't get a gift in a trough. Your gift, your Christmas looks a whole lot better. So there's some things that we can learn when we really think about the Christmas chaos of the first Christmas. I'm going to give you three applications here. Number one is, is very obvious. We need to lighten up a little bit about the Christmas perfection. We need to lighten up a little bit about it. We make this a day of celebration of a holiday rather than celebration of Christ. We need to let go a little bit of the perfection that everyone wants for Christmas. Because, let's be honest, nothing about Christmas is perfect. Nothing about Christmas is perfect. What's perfect about Christmas is Jesus. All those other things, they will fall apart. Things will be overcooked. People will say terrible things. It will not look the way you wanted. Because Christmas isn't perfect. Only Christ is perfect. And that's why we celebrate Christ. And we don't celebrate a day and we don't celebrate traditions. We celebrate Christ. And He is perfect. So we keep our eyes on Christ. Now, I, and I just want to ask, and, you know, I, and I've already kind of painted this picture, and just consider how you would feel if you were Mary. Consider. How would you feel? You've had a baby after a long day of travel in a barn with no friends or family around laid your baby in a manger, and then a bunch of strangers show up to say hi. How do you, do you feel, do you just feel full of Christmas spirit? Just, do you just feel like really like singing carols? Now see, I think most of you would be a Christmas Scrooge. I think most of you would just be bah humbug. And that's what you expect. I really, that's what I see. I would, if I am Mary or Joseph, I'm a like, bah humbug. You know, here come the shepherds. You know what? We don't want any. Thank you very much. Maybe next week sometime. You know, I don't have any figgy pudding for you. But Mary's not that way at all. Mary is not the Christmas Scrooge that you expect her to be. In fact, I love verse 19. It's one of my favorite verses of the whole section. Verse 19 says she's exactly the opposite of a Scrooge. It says, Mary treasured up all these things. She treasured them up. You mean the travel? She treasured it up? You mean the having a baby on a dirty barn floor? She treasured that. Oh, that was fabulous. Oh, a bunch of strangers that crashed her Christmas day. Oh, that was fabulous. She treasured it. No, see, she didn't treasure every little thing that happened. What she treasured was Jesus and their connection to Christ. Every little moment she saw through the lens of Christ. And so she treasured each and every moment. Secondly, I want to say, we need to realize our blessings. Exactly what Mary and Joseph do. Exactly what Mary is doing here. She's treasuring these moments. She is realizing her blessings. I know sometimes at Christmas time, everybody looks at everybody else and goes, well, their grass is greener and they have this and they have that. Realize your blessings. Be like Mary. Mary is treasuring the gift of Jesus Christ. She's not looking around and saying, well, they got this and they got that. And they had the baby over there in the nice hospital. We had, you know, no, 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 no. She is treasuring what she has. Realize your blessing. Thirdly, bless other people. Bless other people. Welcome the stranger. Welcome those dirty shepherds in your life. And you have some dirty shepherds. I know you do. Welcome them. Welcome them. Hug them. Love on them. Let them hang out. Be with them. Be a blessing to other people. Now, I said three, and I actually have four. And then you have to get to this moment, which every year comes for me, and I hope it comes for you. You have to come to this quintessential moment for Christmas. You must ask the Christmas question. You have to get there. You have to ask the Christmas question. 
Well, what's the Christmas question you're saying? It's very simple. It's the question of a child. Why? Why the manger? Why? Why? I mean, let's be honest. We've just dissected the whole Christmas story and looked at it, and we've identified the Christmas story is chaos from beginning to end. Jesus could have had his baby born in a, um, in a palace. God is sovereign, ruler, creator of all of the universe. He could have had anything he wanted. There could have been a parade. Why would God, in all of his power and strength and abilities, have his son, Jesus Christ, born like this? That's the Christmas question. Why? Why would you do it like this? There's two scriptures that I want to share that are the answer to that simple question. Why the Christmas chaos is answered in Hebrews chapter 4 and in Philippians chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says this. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. I want to read that again. We do not have a high priest that is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We don't have a high priest that is unable to understand your chaotic life. You have a high priest that understands pain, suffering, loss, and chaotic, chaotic Christmases. Because that's exactly how his was. He gets it. One who was in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. See, Jesus had chaos for Christmas. Jesus was born in a manger, in a barn, after traveling, you know, who knows how far, on a donkey. Now, that's not actually in your Bible, but there are some writings that say that, that he, was, he traveled on a donkey with Mary. He did all of this. Why? For you. For you. All of it. God wanted to be relatable to you. And he wanted you to be able to relate to him. See, if, if, if he was born in a palace with a great big parade with, you know, million dollar doctors and nurses and every had, you know, silver spoon right there in his mouth, we would be like, well, that's, you know, that's Jesus and he's over there and then we're over here, you know. We don't hang around with those kinds of people. He was born in a manger so that you could be relatable to him, so that he could have a relationship with you, so you would feel that you could understand him more. Secondly, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 says, Let each one look... Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He's saying, have the attitude of Christ Jesus, which is to look into the interests of others. Have an attitude, a godly attitude, which is to care about other people first. And then he goes on, and this is so profound when you, when you really try to get your mind around it. Verse 6 says, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God. And he says it just flat out. He says, a thing to be grasped. Like, I don't really understand what I'm even saying. He was God, yet didn't count himself equally with God. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death and death to a Christ cross. He, oh, he humbled himself first to a manger. He humbled himself to this. See, we think about the, you know, Jesus didn't just give a, a gift of Christmas chaos. I mean, see, we, we think of the chaotic Christmas and we're looking and talking about that. But the truth is, he became a man. That's what Christmas is about. 
Jesus Christ, God, a thing to be grasped, became man for you. Man is chaotic. Have you seen any men? Any time recently? They are chaotic people, amen? Then the lady said amen. All right? I mean, <laughs> but let's be honest. They are petty, emotional, finite, angry, frustrated, flesh. Jesus, now ladies, let's be honest. You're not so admirable either, right? I mean, <laughs> when it, we're not talking just men. Jesus became human, all right? All of us alike, we are petty, <laughs> aren't we? We can get, you can say amen or oh me, right? <laughs> That's what Jesus did. Jesus went from God and became man, this stuff. I mean, think about that. See, we think, oh, it'd be terrible to be born in a barn. That would just be awful. Oh, man, it'd be, it'd be awful, to, you know, when you're pregnant to have to do all this travel. It'd be awful to have to deal with this. And, oh, that'd be chaotic. God became a man. I mean, we can't even grasp that. It'd be like, you know, you saying, if there, this was possible, right? If you could go to some mad scientist and be like, all right, mad scientist, I want to become a spider monkey, right? <laughs> like, it'd be on that level or, or probably even low, lower. I want to become like a single cell amoeba, right? I mean, this is God, the creator of the universe, saying, I will, for these people, become man. I will endure the chaos of these finite people. Hmm. God left his throne to embrace you. That's what Christmas is about. He took off those royal robes to put on sackcloth and mangers to the point of a cross. For you. Everything was for you. The manger was for you. The donkey, it was for you. All the way to the cross. And every moment in between, the sweat, the discomfort, and all the other icky things that come with humanity, it was for you. Every last bit of it. So the question actually changes at that point. I said the Christmas question is why the manger? The, when we really start and we get the answer, we go, well, it doesn't, it, I, if, I, if you understand the Christmas question and you understand the answer that it was all for me and it was all for you, then the question changes. And we stop asking, why is the manger? And then all of a sudden the question becomes, why was there no room? And maybe more importantly, why was there no room in our lives? Why is it that Christmas comes and goes so many years and we stop celebrating Christ and we celebrate so many other little traditions? And I'm not, I love all the Christmas traditions. But so often we miss Jesus and we stop celebrating the Christ. And then we're disappointed that Christmas wasn't what we expected it to be. It wasn't quite as perfect as we had hoped. But it's because we took our eyes off the perfect child, what Christmas is really about. We missed it. Why is it that so often there's no room in our hearts for Christ at Christmas? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Christ has demonstrated absolutely beautiful, perfect love for you himself given wrapped humbly wrapped the greatest christmas gift the greatest the perfect christmas doesn't exist but the perfect christ does and that, that gift has already been given you cannot beat it i don't care what you bought you can't beat that gift and that's why we keep our eyes on the Christ. That gift has been given. And you can receive that gift this morning. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can receive him just like that because the gift has been given. But for so many hearts, it remains unwrapped, unreceived, rejected. 
The scripture says, Roman 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Lord, that is if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is master, if he is ruler, if he is king, if you confess him to be Lord, and you believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, the scripture says you will be saved. That's how you receive the greatest gift ever given. Allow him to become the Lord of your life. Believe in who he was in his death and resurrection for you. And you will receive the perfect Christmas. You bow your heads in prayer with me. Maybe there's one here this morning. Maybe there's one here this morning that's never received that perfect Christmas gift. Have you never made the Lord, the Lord Jesus, your Lord and Savior? If you want to receive Him today, it is simply as, as simple as praying a prayer like this. Heavenly Father, Jesus, become the Lord of my life. Change me in every way. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I believe in your life and in your death. And I want to follow you forever. And if you pray a prayer simply like that and you believe it, the scripture says you will be saved. Is there one here this morning? Is there one here this morning that needs to receive the greatest gift ever given? If that's you, and you just want me to pray with you right now, will you just look at me right now? Amen. Is there another? You've never received that perfect gift. Amen. 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 Is there another? Do you want to receive the most perfect Christmas gift ever given? All right, brother and sister, pray with me. Just pray in your own hearts this prayer. Jesus, I confess my sins. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I believe in your life, in your death, and in your resurrection. I want you to change me, and I want to follow you forever. Tell him in your own words right now that you love him, and that you thank him for that Christmas gift. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Brother and sister, you received the greatest gift ever for Christmas this year. And I'm just so excited that you received this gift. Because there is no greater Christmas gift than the gift of Jesus Christ. And we are going to also celebrate today through baptism. Amen? <laughs> Amen. So we're going to ask Sarah to come forward. Where's Sarah? She's back there. Sarah has accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, and she wants to take the first steps of what it is to follow Jesus. And let me be very clear with this. Following Jesus Christ is very simple. It means that you would follow Him and obey Him. See, if you... If He is ruler, then that means that I will do what He says. Amen? That's what Lord means. It means boss. He becomes the boss. Well, guess what? The, the Lord has some things planned for you. He has lots of things planned for you. And there is none easier, I will say, none easier than baptism. Baptism is not, it is not magic. <laughs> This is tap water. <laughs> this is the same water you take a bath in every day. So maybe you say, well, why bother being baptized? I already have taken many a baths. You know why? Because if Jesus is Lord, then you want to be baptized because he said be baptized. That's it. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then we do what he says. And Jesus has called us that we would make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and in the Holy Spirit. So if you haven't been baptized, but you want to, then you need to talk to Pastor Glenn or myself today because honestly, think about it. How can, you be, how can Jesus be your Lord if you won't take that first step of saying, I'll get wet for Jesus. I will take the plunge. And so today we baptize Sarah. Sarah, 
Uh, I want to just begin with, uh, and ask you, and I'm putting you on the spot, do you want to share anything? <laughs> she says she loves God. <laughs> Amen. All right, will you step in? It's not bad, right? Pastor Glenn is very good at getting this warm anymore. He's got this all like figured out. It's very masterful. Sarah, have you confessed that Jesus is your Lord and that you want to follow him forever? Yes. And do you hear today, profess in front of all of these people, that he will continue to be your Lord and that you'll follow him in every area of your life? Yes. Yes? Then we want to baptize you. You're going to put your hand on your nose. We baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. I would like to know if we could sing one more round of Noel. Is that possible? I'm putting you on the spot. But I just think that singing is an appropriate thing after a baptism. Amen? And I heard this song this week, and, and I like it a lot. <laughs> so let's stand as they get ready.